So up next we have uh, Laurie Barth, uh, who's going to do a software engineer's guide to DevOps. Ooh. I'm excited. All right. All right. Well, let's hear it for Lori. Yeah, let's hear it for Lori. Hi, everyone. So nice to be here. Um, I have this really cool opportunity to talk to everyone all at once, so I wanted to get you to help me out for a second and give a quick round of applause for the organizers and the volunteers and the sponsors. It takes a whole lot to put on a conference. So I appreciate you all being here and not drowning on the way. Kudos. Um, I'm here to talk about a software engineer's guide to DevOps. I'm Lori Barth. You can follow me at Lori on Tech. And I'm a software engineer for a consulting company just outside of DC in Arlington called 10 Mile Square Technologies. And the reason I say that up top is not as a sales pitch. Um, but we're a small company that works with companies, big and small, to solve whatever problems they have. And that means that I wear a lot of hats. And I kind of learn and do whatever it is that our clients need. And about a year ago, whatever they needed was DevOps. And so over the course of six months, I dived into everything I could, um, context and vocabulary and tools and all of that. And quick question for the room, how many of you are DevOps engineers? OK, so like 50-50. There's a version of this talk that introduces you to what DevOps is. But that didn't really seem like the right fit for this crowd. So instead, we're going to follow what's on the back of our t-shirts with a house divided cannot stand. Uh, and we'll get into that now. So. I'm going to be honest, as a software engineer, I haven't had the best of experiences with this thing they call DevOps. One story in particular sticks out. A few years ago, I was working for a company, and the process worked like this. I would write code, and in order to test it, I needed to test it with the full data set. And the full data set required some amount of manual testing. So I wrote code. I committed it to Git, I pushed it, and then Jenkins would take over, do an automatic build for me. I would SSH into the QA box, I would do a simple command, and it would pull the most recent build onto that box. Not too bad. Well, one day, it didn't work out quite that way. Instead of success, the new builds on the box, I got a message that said, this random file that you've never seen or heard of is locked. So I tried to do what I could, and I had no permissions on that machine. That meant I had to track down the operations person that I knew, and he wasn't at his desk, because he was pulled in about a million different directions. So two hours later, two hours of being blocked, I finally get a hold of him. All he has to do is log on to the box, delete the file, say try again, everything's good to go. Sound familiar? Does that sound like developers trying to track you down? Now, the next story is not mine. It's a friend of mine. And full disclosure, I had no idea that they were a sponsor until just this morning. So <laughs> we're going to go easy. Um, so she was working on a project for a client. And she was integrating with a very specific version of Elasticsearch. The operations team at the company had set up an environment for her where that version of Elasticsearch was running. Good. She came in one morning, and the Elasticsearch version had jumped. Well, it needed to be pinned to this specific version. Luckily, she had permissions. She spent kind of all day dealing with permissions and versioning. We all know how much of a nightmare that can be. She goes home. She goes to sleep. She wakes up. She comes back to the office. The Elasticsearch version has jumped again. And she calls up the operations team. And she says, hey, what is going on? And they say, oh, it must be Chef. She has no idea what that means. And for those of you who don't know, Chef is a configuration management tool. And you define your configuration using a recipe. Very clever. Um, and at some time interval, they check against each other. And if the running environment doesn't match the recipe, the recipe wins. 
which is why she had all these great permissions to change whatever she wanted, because they didn't care. It was going to get overwritten anyway. So she goes to try and figure out what the heck they mean when they say, it must be chef. She gets a lot of marketing mumbo jumbo. She gets a lot of terms that she's never heard of and can't make sense of. And she says, OK, I'm going to throw my hands up and wait for them to fix it, and I'll be blocked as long as they do. Sound familiar? Does this sound like kind of the push and pull that you experience with developers? In my prior experience, before I learned about this thing called DevOps, um, my interaction with DevOps went a little bit like this. I wrote code, I pushed it to Git, probably merged it into some major branch um, or the trunk. I waited for Jenkins to pick it up and build it, and then I threw it over a wall. I had no idea what happened on the other side of that wall. I didn't really want to know. It sounded confusing and obnoxious and slightly evil. Um, and so the wall stood between me and operations, and I knew my side. And this created kind of this natural tension that I think exists with a lot of teams between developers and operations. And it's what this culture of DevOps is supposed to help remediate. And the tension comes from a few places. One of the things that I think makes a big difference is this lack of knowledge. As a developer, I don't know the tools. I don't know the context. I don't know the considerations at play. In fact, the only thing I see is constraints. To me, it's a bunch of rules that I need to follow to make sure that I don't break things, a box that I need to fit into. And that lack of knowledge and the idea that this is all kind of making my job harder leads to frustration on both sides, both on the operations side of the coin and the developer side of the coin, that wall. And it silos us so that we don't want to understand the other side of the coin. Developers, in particular, kind of throw their hands up and say, I don't have permissions. I don't have access. I don't understand any of this. I'm not going to get involved. And I kind of picture this like two siblings on either corner of a wall with their arms crossed, being like, you make my job harder. No, you make my job harder. So for developers, it's this mentality of, I just need it to work. I know my code is broken. I don't know how. I don't know what I don't know. So I need to get it on this box. I need to put it in this environment to see what these other variables are going to do to code that I pray is working, but who knows? And DevOps is standing there saying, stop breaking things. You have way too much freedom. You get the run of this whole place. And all you do is make more problems for me. So how do we solve this? They gave me that nice intro at the beginning, tear down that wall. Um, how do we work towards the same goals? Because we have the same goals. A house Divided cannot stand. This theming is working great for me today. Um, I thought about this a lot. And one of the things that occurred to me is that we're all engineers. Our meta goals are different in terms of what our focus area is, but we all have similar justifications and motivations. So what about this novel concept of treating each other like engineers? What would that look like? What would that do? What would that change? Engineers have something in common, regardless of what their focus area is. They want to know the why. They're not satisfied with just being told to do something. They want to understand why they're doing it and how it works. So for DevOps, that has a lot of different ways to view it. That can be, I need to know the edge cases. That can be, I need to know what your environment needs. But what it really is, 
It comes down to what are the risks? What do I need to be aware of to make sure that this thing doesn't blow up in my hands? Because you don't seem to know what I need to know. And for developers, they are looking at these constraints. They're looking at these things that they think make them, makes their job harder. And what they really want to know is where do I fit in? How am I a piece of this puzzle? What does this process look like? And what am I doing to make it easier or harder? Because this is the crazy part. The reality is that developers' lives are made easier by DevOps. It's a bit of hyperbole, but no one's going to care about their code quite as much as developers do. Their blood, sweat, and tears for weeks or months or years went into making these applications. They care that all of this effort wasn't for naught, that it ends up in front of customers, that it serves its purpose, that it does what they built it to do. They didn't spend all this time combing through bugs in the backlog just for people to get a blank screen. DevOps matters to them. They just might not understand why. One of the first things I learned in this six-month journey was about CI CD pipelines. And two things jumped out to me right away as something that mattered to me as a developer. The first was between local environment and shared dev test. In this example, it's a Docker container, but there's many other ways to do this, as you all know. The idea that I could put an environment that mimicked QA and production directly on my local machine, that I could see everything my application code would be touching, get rid of all my bugs, eliminate all my risk, know that I'm promoting something more than dropping it into a new pond and hoping that my fish swims. The other thing that CI CD pipelines can do and do do that developers benefit from is cycle time. Too often we talk about what it takes to make development go faster. And rarely is it how smart your engineers are and how fast they can type. Most of the time, it's the idea that developers write code and pigs don't fly, so it's not going to work the first time. They write code, they test it, and they iterate. How long does that process take? How much of that iteration is them waiting around for things to build or things to deploy? What does that look like? How much time are they waiting for to hope they can get in touch with the DevOps engineer because they broke something? The other thing that I learned in this six months was that DevOps itself has real reasons and benefits. That's why you do the work you do. You wouldn't do it if it didn't matter. And those reasons and benefits are things developers should know, because it affects them too. Who cares about code more than the ones who built it? The first thing that stuck out to me was repeatability. The idea that every time you're deploying the application, you're taking it that last mile, you're making sure that it follows that process the same way every time. And that's so important to me as a developer because I spent all, those, all that time on the bugs and handling the edge cases and making sure that we've handled all our risks. And the worst case scenario is that every time we deploy, we're doing it a different way and all my work is a wash. It doesn't matter. That matters to me. Scalability. It's always interesting to me that developers spend so much time thinking about scalability within their own code. They make multi-threaded applications. They make calls asynchronous. They'll even architect an entire system in microservices because they think it'll be more scalable. Well, DevOps goes even a step further with that. It makes sure that we can have multiple instances of that application I built. It makes sure that traffic is getting routed in the right ways and things aren't going down. The worst case scenario is that the code that I wrote doesn't get that last mile. 
It doesn't get in front of a customer. It doesn't matter how good of a job I did. If it can't get there, it makes no difference. This matters to me. This is one of my favorite meme cartoon things. Because I don't know about any of you, but if you've ever developed for a larger company that all uses the same Jenkins build, you have had the time-honored tradition of sitting there and seeing two threads running, about 10 jobs waiting in the queue, and yours is the very last one. So scalability is something developers understand really well. And this goes to that cycle time. These things affect not just the application in production, but it affects their development experience. All of these things should matter to us as developers. And automation. I know at the beginning of the conference they made the joke about who's on call. Developers get put on call too, right? We're a part of that uh, rotation. And I'm sure you nor I want to be the one to miss the 2 AM email saying that everything is melting down because we didn't scale. Automation has such a big impact on all of us. It affects our on-call rotations, but it also affects our ability to keep that application in front of customers, to make sure that the work that we do matters. And failure states. DevOps is all about preventing failure, right? It's why you do what you do. And for developers, that is the ultimate. The last mile. I've said that about six times, but it's so important because too often developers think that their job ends with their code. But their code isn't running on their local environment. So even if they say it works on my machine, well, that doesn't really apply, right? It doesn't help anyone. If you care that much about your code, if you put that time and that energy and that effort in, you want to make sure that it ends up on the screen of the person you built it for. So what does that look like? And how do we do it? And how do developers have more of a hand in being successful? Part of this is considering everyone. There's a process and a solution, and you want your developers to be involved in it instead of throwing things over a wall and hoping that they, it doesn't have a bomb hidden in it. Part of this is tool selection. Choosing tools that work for everyone. Choosing tools that everyone can understand, that everyone has access to, that they can be effective in shepherding their code a little more seamlessly, along a conveyor belt instead of jumping over a wall. What you're really trying to do is blur the lines between developers and operations. That's why they made the DevOps name, right? And the reality is that your developers aren't going to become DevOps experts. And you don't want them to be. Because if they try and do two things well, they're going to do neither of them well. You still want your experts. You still want your DevOps engineers. What you're really after is having them meet in the middle, moving your de developers just a little bit closer to your operations side giving them some overlap. Because that overlap allows you to do really amazing things. It allows developers to give more relevant information as things move to the next gate. What systems need to talk to each other? What versions of dependencies might have an impact? What level of robustness should this application have? What kind of traffic might we expect to see? You're allowing for these smoother handoffs between teams because the first team understands what the second team needs from them, what information is relevant to their jobs, because they, at a certain level, understand what that job is trying to do. Now, I'm sure you're sitting here thinking, just because I give my developers overview of our pipeline and our process doesn't mean I'm comfortable giving them access. And I understand that. But I caution you against it, because I think access is the only way that they're actively involved in those solutions. It's the only way they're not calling you up and say, to say, hey, I'm locked out of this box. I can't do anything, and blocked for two hours, and you're annoyed because you had six meetings today. And there's ways to do this. And I think my experience 
gave me a lot of good entry points. So what's interesting to me about DevOps versus writing code is that there aren't major differences. Your goal is very different, but the tools that you use and the process that they use, there are a lot of parallels between them. The most obvious is probably infrastructure as code. And I found a lot of different examples with this that felt very accessible to me as a developer, but one really stood out. And just to say this up top, um, even though we're almost done, uh, this, I'm not you know, saying use this particular tool, it's just an example. So there is actually an NPM package called serverless that does serverless. And if you go to their GitHub repository, they have an entire examples directory. In that examples directory, you will find pretty much every modern coding language coupled with all of the existing AWS databases, at least out of the, as of this writing. And you will find a CloudFormation template that stands up an API gateway in that language for that database. How amazing is that? What I loved about it was that I know what an API looks like. I write backend code. So for me, I could look directly at that project. I could see my endpoints and see the one-to-one -one mapping with the CloudFormation template. I could understand how things were getting deployed, what considerations there were, what I had to worry about, what the operations side of my company had to worry about. Another thing that was incredibly helpful was templates and, do and GUIs. And I kind of hate this mentality we have, as developers especially, that using visual aids is training wheels, and you're not hardcore if you do so. It's particularly bad in DevOps because so much of DevOps is data visualization of how things move through a process, or what's happening when, there's lot, when things are live, green versus red status, that kind of thing. One of the things I found incredibly helpful and accessible was using the baked-in Helm template, just the example, going to Docker Hub and pulling an image of something I recognized, whether that was Nginx or Postgres or even Jenkins. I could take the name of that Docker image and the tag and replace it in the Helm template and run a couple simple commands the first was minikube start. As long as I put Kubernetes on my local machine, this was all I had to run. With the Helm template, I could run the Helm template against it, and I ended up with this. I've got a deployment, I've got a pod, I've got a replica set. I'm not touching anything in production. It's a total playground. I got to iterate with this and see what impacts it had. I could look at failover, I could look at making dependencies for databases. Everything I did gave me the opportunity to further see what I was accomplishing and what I could accomplish. Now, you're not all using Helm or Kubernetes or AWS or serverless, and that's okay. But these tools have a lot of similarities. They're trying to accomplish similar ends. They have different gotchas. And allowing developers time to have a bit of a playground, a safe space, will make them more comfortable with using whatever your pipeline consists of. And this isn't just about making a cross-functional team. It's about having these overlaps of knowledge that we've been talking about. If developers better understand everything you do, they can better support your requests for information and make you doing your job easier. They just need some context. So what does that look like? It's giving them those entry points. It's giving them a safe place to test things out, to iterate, to look at what it is that you're trying to accomplish, that you're trying to do day to day to see those constraints and how hard it is to do your job, that twilight zone of deploy the thing that's doing the deployment. I mean, mind-blowing. Helping them understand that will help them help you. 
It's helping them understand where they fit in. They're engineers, just like you are. As developers, we want to know the why. We want to understand the unfamiliar terrain around us. If we get the puzzle piece that we are, we can better see our connection points, our integration points, what points of failure we may be creating, what risk we're introducing. And this is probably the most important takeaway. DevOps should matter to developers. I know that once I dove into it a step further, it became so apparent to me how integral it was to my success and the team's success and the company's success. And I'm still a software engineer. I enjoy being a software engineer. But learning DevOps has made me far more successful than I was before because I'm making sure my code goes that last mile. I'm making sure I'm giving the relevant information to the people it applies to. And if I need to jump on a box or into a Jenkins job or whatever it is, I can probably figure it out. So thank you so much for coming. I hope you enjoy the kitten in the bow tie and enjoy the rest of the conference.